Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Crossroads Cultural Center, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this fourth annual Albacete Lecture on Faith and Culture. The lecture has been established by Crossroads to honor the memory of Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete, who chaired its advisory board until he passed away. Uh, we're coming up on the fifth anniversary of his death and it is the highlight of Crossroads yearly program. A special thanks to the Sheen Center for hosting this very special event and to the Albacete Forum for helping to organize it. My name is John Tui, and I'm one of the founders of the Albacete Forum. I had the very great gift of knowing Monsignor Albacete personally for many, many years. And uh, those of you who share this privilege with me know about Monsignor's warmth, his humor, his intelligence, and most importantly, you know of the faith that penetrated every fiber of his being and every aspect of his life, whether it be in his interest in the great questions of the day or in very seemingly mundane things like his love for fried chicken, um, which you can see he loved it a lot. Uh, but for Monsignor, nothing was mundane at all. Now, it is a truism that there is no such thing as a stupid question. Of course, we know that there are stupid questions in life. But one of the things that always struck me about Monsignor, and I think one of the things that made him almost magnetically attractive to people, was the way he took your questions very seriously. Even questions that might seem very basic or even stupid to many of us. About 20 years ago, I was with Monsignor and a group of friends in Evansville, Indiana, um, for an event, and Monsignor was at a uh, table with a, a group of teenagers. Young people always were very attracted to Monsignor and, and wanted to be with him. And so these uh, teenagers were asking him questions about life, about faith and whatnot. And among these teenagers, there was a, an eight-year-old boy named Noah. And Noah is a very precocious young boy and he really wanted to be involved in this discussion. So these kids are asking these very serious questions about their lives and stuff. And all of a sudden, uh, Noah blurts out, Monsignor, why did God make dinosaurs? And the other kids kind of giggled, you know, that's a very childish question. It's a very stupid question that we think, in the way we think of things. And um, Monsignor loved it. So he starts engaging with Noah. Oh, oh Noah, you, you like dinosaurs? Oh, I love dinosaurs. Oh, I like dinosaurs too. And so they began talking about dinosaurs. And then he said, well, you see, Noah, that's why God made dinosaurs, because you love them. God made dinosaurs for you because he knew you, Noah, would love them. And the table went silent. Everybody was mesmerized because, and he started talking about the personal love that God had for each and every person. And it was an incredible discussion. So I really wanted to be, sit at that table with the teenagers there. And, and that was really uh, who Monsignor was to me. You know, um, that, that it wasn't a heady spiritual exercise that, Theology for him was something that had to do with the, the deepest but the simplest questions of life, those questions that when we're children we have too. And um, it was at that moment that I, I really understood that there was something very, very extraordinary about, about this man, Lorenzo Albacete. And that's why the, for the past two years, I've been working with a group of friends to try and preserve and publish his writings, his talks and, and memories of this man that this lecture series is named after. Monsignor Albacete's intelligence and passion animated Crossroads from the start. He often reminded us that our most important mission and challenge was to reawaken people in people an interest in the full spectrum of reality, and especially in what is happening in our society today. One of the areas that certainly drew his attention was the dramatic relationship between authentic religiosity and secularization. Albacete often invited Crossroads to try and understand the origin, the dynamic, and manifestation of this relationship. From this point of view, he interestingly said at the Crossroads Advisory Board meeting in 2012, you see, this is quoting Monsignor, part of the success of the dominant secularist culture is to try and succeed in hiding how interesting the Christian claim is, how beautiful, but above all, how interesting. And how does it do so? By killing anything that's interesting, but by deciding itself what is interesting, by diminishing the reality of interesting, 
especially in our youth. For instance, questions like, why did God make dinosaurs? To continue, in the end, nothing really interests you enough to change your life so that you can fix your attention, at least to investigate further. The capacity to be interested in anything has to be weakened if it cannot be destroyed, and it cannot, thank God. But it can be so weakened that nothing is interesting. And this is the way to block the infinite interestedness associated with the Christian life. For Albacete, the only purpose of this investigation into the secular world was not winning a war, but being able to full-heartedly dialogue with it. And according to St. Paul's suggestion, and that this is Crossroads' motto, to test it and retain what is good. Following in his footsteps tonight, we are truly fortunate to have with us Professor William Cavanaugh, who has dedicated much study and reflection to the relationship between religiosity and secularization. As you will see in your program, William Cavanaugh is Professor of Catholic Studies and Director of the Center of, for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul University. Please help me welcome Professor Cavanaugh to the stage. Thanks so much, John, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for coming out tonight. It's kind of fun to emerge from backstage like this. I feel like I should burst into song or something like that, but um, uh, thanks to everybody who's organized this, um, Angelo and uh, Stephen and Rita and uh, John. Um, a lot of hard work goes into this. I'm especially um, grateful to be here to honor uh, Prof uh, Monsignor Albacete, I'd never met him uh, when he was alive, but I used one of his books, or I guess his, his um, uh, so far, his, his one published book, uh, God at the Ritz, uh, with a class of undergraduates when I taught at the University of St. Thomas. And the thing that I really loved about it was just the kind of quiet, uh, gentle confidence um, with which Monsignor Albacete embraced uh, and confronted the modern world. Um, there was no fear about him. He thought, um, had this kind of sense that God was in, in charge uh, no matter how chaotic things got. And I think that uh, sense kind of uh, radiated across to the students. So 99 years ago, the famed German sociologist Max Weber published a revised edition of his classic work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and inserted into the new edition were a few uses of the word entzauberung, uh, a word that didn't appear in the original version, and the word was meant to describe the general condition of modernity. Zauber in the, in the German is magic, and entzauberung is literally the unmagicking of the world. It's usually translated disenchantment, and although it was used sparingly by Weber, the word has kind of taken on a life of its own, and it's generally regarded as capturing something essential about life in our present condition. So in his exploration of the causes of secularization in the West, philosopher Charles Taylor has written, everyone can agree that one of the big differences between us and our ancestors of 500 years ago is that they lived in an enchanted world and we do not. So our ancestors lived in a world inhabited by gods and demons and ghosts and angels and wood sprites and saints. And the boundaries between the material and the spiritual were permeable and the imminent world made frequent contact with the transcendent. The world was full of what Taylor calls char charged objects such as relics that had the power to alter reality. And today the story goes, we live in a disenchanted world, a world devoid of divine or demonic spirits, devoid of mystery, devoid of an ordered meaning. In Weber's view, disenchantment was the end result of a long process of rationalization of which science and capitalism were the principal drivers. Weber was himself a rationalist who confessed himself unmusical with regard to religion but Weber did not simply celebrate the process of rationalization and disenchantment. He thought that the technical advances of modernity came at a price. 
uh, Weber feared that modern people had become specialists without spirit, sensualists without heart. This nullity imagines that it has attained a level of civilization never before achieved. Harsh language. Weber's famous book ends with a melancholy description of the iron cage of modernity, a heartlessly efficient machine from which all enchantment had been ruthlessly eliminated for better and for worse. So for an example of such a machine, I would like to suggest a visit to an Amazon warehouse. In his wildest dreams or nightmares, Max Weber could not have foreseen the lengths to which rationalization has been taken in an Amazon fulfillment center. Their poorly paid associates who are often temporary workers with no benefits scurry among the bins, retrieving and packing just about anything that can be imagined. A handheld device keeps track of the workers' movements it directs them to the next item to pick, and a timer starts. 27 seconds to scan in the next item, four aisles over, for example. I actually just uh, stopped in the airport uh, today and found a copy of The New Yorker. There's an article about Amazon in the latest New, New Yorker called Is Amazon Unstoppable? And I discovered that this 27 seconds was actually overly generous um, one worker is quoted as saying they're expected to pick an item every eight seconds. The device warns them if they're falling behind and keeps track of their pick rate, falling behind, calling in sick, and other offenses can cost a worker their job, so some associates have resorted to urinating in bottles to avoid taking bathroom breaks. In January 2018, Amazon received patents on a wristband that can track a, work, a warehouse worker's arm movements. Responding to the negative reaction, an Amazon spokesperson presented the wristband as a liberating boon for workers. The speculation about this patent is misguided. This idea, if implemented in the future, would improve the process of a, for our fulfillment associates. By moving equipment to associates' wrists, we could free up their hands from scanners and their eyes from computer screens." End quote. But according to James Bloodworth, who worked at an Amazon fulfillment center for six months, the real goal is not liberation of human beings, but liberation from human beings, either by turning them into robots or replacing them with robots. It was all obsessed with productivity. People were told off for taking five minutes to go to the bathroom. They started treating human beings as robots, essentially. If it proves cheaper to replace humans with machines, I assume they will do that, end quote. In the Amazon warehouse, Weber's description of the iron cage seems fully vindicated. But so far, I've only been telling one side of the story. The other side of the story has to do not with production, but with consumption. And this is where the rest of us enter the picture. For the consumer, the purchase of nearly anything via Amazon is hardly short of magical. Images of millions of products can be summoned onto a screen. The viewer can spend hours lost in a virtual environment of endless abundance, immersed in images of almost any material product you can imagine. Then you simply make a few clicks and the desired product appears on your doorstep like magic. And you can see how the packages have become animated and smile. If you have the money or at least access to credit, almost anything from anywhere in the world can be summoned out of thin air to materialize abracadabra at your home. The entire production process of sourcing raw materials and manufacturing and transportation and packing and order fulfillment and delivery is invisible to the consumer as are the people involved in those processes. The dirt and the sweat and the blood and the tears necessary to create and move products as efficiently as possible are hidden from the consumer. All we see are images of the shiny finished products and the products desired can be made simply to appear, often at fantastically cheap prices, at our homes. And so it seems that there are two sides to the modern economy, a rationalized, disenchanted one typified by heartless efficiency, and an enchanted one still filled with charged objects and magic. So tonight I'm going to explore the possibility that these are two sides of the same coin. And I want to explore this idea through uh, three sources that make for strange bedfellows. Max Weber, Karl Marx, and the Bible. So I'll first argue that contrary to the usual reading of him, 
Weber himself could not shake free of the idea that modernity was haunted by enchantment in capitalist production. Um, can you go back? Yeah. Um, Weber could not f shake free of the idea that modernity was haunted by enchantment in capitalist production. I will then examine enchantment in consumption through Marx's idea of commodity fetishism. And finally, I'll argue that the biblical concept of idolatry captures what both Weber and Marx struggled to diagnose and to cure. So first, production. The tale Weber tells about disenchanted is, disenchantment is complicated, but I'm going to summarize it in a few steps. First, religion is the original agent of rationalization, but rationalization eventually pushes religion out of the public sphere. Most uses of Weber stop there at the disenchantment of the world. But Weber also implies that, thirdly, rationalization produces a new form of enchantment, a kind of polytheism, as he puts it, of impersonal gods, which include the state and the market. So let's start with step one. Weber regards magic as a primitive form of religion. Early cultures practiced magic to try to control nature and mitigate its various dangers. So if we perform a certain dance, it will rain. Magic was this worldly, in other words. It was not ethical, but transactional. Magic tried to coerce or bribe the spirits that lived in material things. And there's a sort of rationality in this quid pro quo. When the great salvation religions erupted in the axial age, however, they introduced a new kind of rationalization. The gods were now personal, otherworldly, transcending the material world, and interactions with them took on an ethical tone. Such gods were universal rather than local, and this gave rise to the notion of stable and universal laws that govern nature and society. A rational social order was complemented by an intellectual order in which the human need for coherent meaning was answered. People needed a way to deal with senseless suffering. So salvation religions developed the myth of a savior and an ethical system in which the gods could punish the unjust and reward the righteous. Since so often in this life the righteous suffered and the unjust prospered, explanations were sought outside of the life of the present world, so present suffering could be explained by sin committed in a former life or by one's ancestors. Or an afterlife was posited to ensure that the guilty were punished and the righteous rewarded. In both cases, theodicy necessitated appeal to a world beyond the present world as we know it. All of this is according to Max Weber, of course. For Weber, this puts salvation religions in a state of permanent tension with the world. And that leads to step two. The more rationalized religion becomes, the more otherworldly it becomes. And the worldly spheres of politics, economics, family, sex, etc., take on increasing autonomy. Worldly activity like business and war cannot meet the high ethical standards of the great salvation religions. So the religious person either flees the world in mysticism or becomes a worldly ascetic, like the Puritan, who Weber says accepts the ultimate meaninglessness of the world but tries to work out his salvation in inner dialogue with God while following his worldly vocation as a business person. So this is how Protestantism leads to capitalism, according to Weber. For the Puritan, the Catholic sacraments were magic, an attempt to manipulate God. So the Reformation, according to Weber, swept the world clean of all such idols so that God would be all in all, but eliminating God from the material world to protect the holiness of God would eventually lead to a disenchanted world where worldly pursuits such as economics and science and politics would be autonomous and deal only in facts and not values. So I'm simplifying a long and complex story here, but Weber basically argues that salvation religions uh, Thank you. Um, salvation religions rationalize suffering by positing an otherworldly sphere. This leads to a split between this world and the other world between facts and values that eventually pushes religion to the private sphere of values and leaves an autonomous, disenchanted world of fact governed by science, the state, and the capitalist market. So here we are in the iron cage. Science deals only with facts. It cannot produce meaning. Capitalism responds to whatever the market dictates. Values are irrelevant to it. 
The bureaucracy of the state seeks efficiency and does not respond to the will of God and so on. So for a lot of people, what they know about Weber ends there in disenchantment, the elimination of magic from the world. But Weber takes a third step that's often not noticed and writes not only of the godlessness of the modern world, but what he calls polytheism. It has to do with his conviction that humans have an elemental need for meaning. And this is one of the ways of connecting uh, with uh, Monsignor Abbasete and, um, uh, and Giussani's idea of the, um, the, the religious sense. For Weber, the split between fact and meaning or value is both a fact and a serious problem because we urgently want to know what the meaning of our lives is. According to Weber, Science is meaningless because it gives no answer to our question, the only question important for us. What shall we do and how shall we live? Weber rejects the idea that we can return to religion. He regards that route as suitable only for the person who's too weak to face the fundamental fact that he is destined to live in a godless and profitless time. But Weber translates the question, what shall we do and how shall we live, into which of the warring gods should we serve? Or should we serve perhaps an entirely different god? And who is he? Polytheism is a direct consequence of rationalization. So the divorce between fact and value means that, quote, the various value spheres of the world stand in irreconcilable conflict with one another, end quote. Because there's no factual basis to adjudicate rival claims of values. You believe what you believe, I believe what I believe, and so they can only be decided by non-rational means. We have to just take this irrational leap of choosing some values. And so Weber writes, we live as did the ancients when their world was not yet disenchanted of its gods and demons, only we live in a different sense, as Hellenic man at times sacrificed to Aphrodite and at other times to Apollo, and above all, as everybody sacrificed to the gods of his city, so we still do nowadays. Only the bearing of man has been disenchanted and denuded of its mystical but inwardly genuine plasticity. Now here it's important to note that Weber seems to observe no difference in the empirically observable behavior of ancient versus modern people. And so Weber continues, Many old gods ascend from their graves. They are disenchanted and hence take the form of impersonal forces. They strive to gain power over our lives and again they resume their eternal struggle with one another. In Weber's view, Apollo has been replaced by impersonal forces like capitalism. But gods is not a casual metaphor. As Weber says, they strive to gain power over our lives. Weber believed that the human individual has the freedom to make in a decisive choice among the various gods on offer. But this choice stands out against the backdrop of the dreary constraints under which such a choice is made. So the gods that can be chosen must struggle not only against each other, but against the gods that are simply given to us. And so Weber, for example, writes of how Puritan asceticism quote, did its part in building the tremendous cosmos of the modern economic order. This order is now bound to the technical and economic conditions of machine production, which today determine the lives of all the individuals who are born into this mechanism, not only those directly concerned with economic acquisition, with irresistible force. Perhaps it will so determine them until the last ton of fossilized coal is burnt. Weber continues on to say that, quote, material goods have gained an increasing and finally an inexorable power over the lives of men as at no previous period in history. Now in the 19th century, figures like Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche thought that doing away with God or gods would be a liberation for human beings. Humanity would finally take the reins of its own destiny in hand and effect liberating change Weber, on the other hand, is much more pessimistic. He emphasized the fragmented nature of human meaning and the power and inertia of large social institutions such that liberating change would be impossible. Weber seems to agree with Marx and Nietzsche that there is no pre-given order, that, that we're just 
all humans are making it all up. For Weber, however, human technical prowess produces wonders, but we come to be dominated by our own creations. He calls them living machines, which are made in our own image and likeness. So there is no true God to save us from ourselves. The creations of humanity are unpredictable and ungovernable precisely because there is no inherent order to the cosmos. And so humans are controlled by our own artifacts. As the monster says to Dr. Frankenstein, you are my creator, but I am your master. Obey. So the gods eliminated by rationalization return in a different form to rule over us. In the political sphere, Weber describes how nation states employ rationalized violence to protect borders, pushing religious scruples like the pacifism of the Sermon on the Mount into the private sphere of values. But war then out-religions religion, creating a new form of devotion to the nation state War makes for an unconditionally devoted and sacrificial community among the combatants and releases an act of mass compassion and love for those who are in need. In general, religions can show comparable achievements only in heroic communities professing an ethic of brotherliness, end quote. Weber continues on to argue that the state does a better job than religion at giving meaning to death. In the economic sphere, Weber describes capitalism as the height of rationalization, precisely in its depersonalization of transactions. Money, says Weber, is, quote, the most abstract and impersonal element that exists in human life, end quote. And he adds, for this reason, one speaks of the rule of capital and not of capitalists, end quote. Humans are not in charge, but are being ruled by a god of their own making, Making money is no longer a means to serve the life of people. Quote, it is thought of so purely as an end in itself that from the point of view of the happiness of or utility to the single individual, it appears entirely transcendental, and absolutely irrational. Man is dominated by the making of money, by acquisition as the ultimate purpose of his life. Economic acquisition is no longer subordinated to man as the means for satisfaction of his material needs. Um, there's something about of, of John Paul II uh, here. It seems that uh, um, e economy is, is, is no longer subordinated to human beings, but the other way around. And so in a supposedly secularized world, we continue to serve gods that are every bit as transcendent and irrational in Weber's words, as the old gods were. The holy has not disappeared, but migrated from the church to the state and the market. And note that Weber is not as interested in what people say they believe as in how they behave, and that's why he can simultaneously describe people as disenchanted and still yet sacrificing to gods. Okay, so, so far, production. Now consumption. We will move from the Amazon warehouse to the website and to the happy packages that land on our doorstep. Is this a realm of disenchantment, of rationalized materialism? Well, the famous materialist Karl Marx did not think so. When a table is made for use, there is nothing mysterious about it. You put stuff on it, it holds it up off the floor. But when it becomes a commodity for exchange, Mark, Marx writes, Quote, it has changed into something transcendent. It becomes a strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. Another quote from Marx. As commodities, things float free from the material conditions of their production and from their own physical properties as use values. So Marx writes, in order to find an analogy, we must have recourse to the mist-enveloped regions of the religious world in that world, the productions of the human brain appear as independent beings endowed with life and entering into relation both with one another and the human race. So it is in the world of commodities and the products of men's hands. This I call the fetishism which attaches itself to the products of labor. Now by fetishism, Marx meant more than people obsessing about material things. He meant that material things become enchanted and take on a life of their own just as in so-called primitive cultures, fetishes were small carvings that were seen as inhabited by spirits and capable of working magic. 
As commodities for exchange, objects are ex abstracted from their use and their value depends not on their usefulness but on what they can be exchanged for. For example, despite widespread hunger, farmers dump milk and the, and the government warehouses cheese to support the price of dairy. What matters is the exchange value and not the use value. So commodities are, in a sense, dematerialized because their physical properties are swamped by their exchange value. Cheese is not primarily food for people to consume, but a commodity to be exchanged for money. And because their value is expressed relative to other commodities, Marx says, commodities establish social relations among themselves. In the market, commodities take on life and become subjects of relations with other commodities. So the, there's a kind of irony in the, in the smiling uh, Amazon packages. While things take on life, life is drained away from actual people. Hungry people don't count in the market unless they have money. In the labor market, labor is abstract and interchangeable. Workers are regard as, regarded as labor costs which need to be minimized. The conditions of work are hidden by commodities. All the consumer sees in the store or on Amazon.com is the commodity and its price. It takes a great effort to uncover the people who actually make the product and deliver it and the conditions under which they work. The commodities are visible and not the people, in other words. Commodities take on life as life is extracted from people. This transfer of life from humans to products is captured by Eduardo Galeano's description of life under free market military dictatorships in Latin America in the 1970s and 1980s. He said people were in prison so that prices could be free. As did Weber, Marx observes that the process of production has the mastery over man instead of being controlled by him. That's a quote from Marx. Before the Industrial Revolution, people made nearly everything they had in their homes or it was made by people they knew. Things were closely linked to their makers and to their use value. Now we make almost nothing and buy everything. Of course, there's no point in romanticizing the poverty of the past, but it's hard to overestimate what a change this is and how we relate to the material world and to people. We used to make things and now we buy things. When the sheer volume of things in the world took a quantum leap in the 19th century because of mass production, people needed to be taught as one advertising manual put it in 1901, that they have wants that they did not recognize before. People had to fall in love with commodities. Commodities had to be more than just things to be used. They had to be enchanted, the smiling packages again. So if we look at the history of advertising, we can see how things took flight from the material world and into the realm of transcendence. In the 19th century, advertising was largely informational. You can buy shoes at John H. Johnson's shop. By the early 20th century, advertising had become more about persuading than informing, but it was still closely related to the physical product. As in this shoe advertisement, the ad showed a picture of the shoe and talked about the virtues of the actual physical shoe. The objective was to convince the reader that this is a comfortable, reasonably priced, well-made, stylish shoe. The ad appeals both to the consumer's rational sense of use value, easy to walk in, won't fall apart, and also to the buyer's more intangible sense of fashion, of being recognized by others as stylish and so on. By the mid 20th century, there was a shift farther away from use value and toward the more tangible I'm sorry, the more intangible and spiritual aspirations of the consumer for freedom, sex, prestige, recognition, other forms of transcendence. Now in this shoe ad, mid-century, the shoe still appears, but go ahead and gasp, by the way, um, entirely appropriate. The shoe still appears, but gone is any appeal to use value. There's no description of the virtues of the, of the actual shoe, there's no mention of the shoe at all, in fact. Under the influence of Freud and Pavlov and others, advertisers began to appeal not to the conscious self, but the unconscious. The ad does not lie because it doesn't make any explicit claims at all. 
It associates a physical commodity with non-physical aspirations, in this case, towards transcendence of one's own drab life and into a realm of pathetic male fantasy where beautiful women drop at one's feet. As in Pavlov's experiments with dogs, two completely different things, meat and a bell, in this case, domination and dress shoes are associated in the subconscious. The second of these things matters little. Pavlov could have used a whistle instead of a bell. Sex can be associated with cars or shampoo or soda as well as shoes. So the actual material objects have begun to matter less than the fantasy world associated with them. As consumerism is taking flight from products, the brand comes to take on more importance than material products. Beginning in the 1940s, corporations began exploring what brands mean to culture and to people's lives. Brands increasingly became ways of marking one's identity. So corporate marketers like Bruce Barton began to encourage businesses to discover their souls. More and more corporations use theological language to describe themselves. As one corporate manager frankly put it, quote, corporate branding is really about worldwide beliefs management, end quote. Worldwide beliefs management. One more shoe ad. By the beginning of the 21st century, as this ad shows, the actual product was capable of vanishing entirely. The leading corporations are now more concerned with manufacturing brands than manufacturing products. Products are made in the factory, but brands are made in the mind. According to Naomi Klein, the key moment was when in 1988, Philip Morris brought, bought not Kraft the company, but Kraft the brand for $12.6 billion. As Klein says of transcendent brands, quote, Liberated from the real world burdens of stores and product manufacturing, these brands are free to soar, less the disseminators of goods or services than as collective hallucinations. What Starbucks sells is not so much coffee, as CEO Howard Schultz puts it, but, quote, the romance of the coffee experience, the feeling of warmth and community people get in Starbucks stores, end quote. So as Klein writes, in the new market, the product always takes a back seat to the real product, the brand, and the selling of the brand acquired an extra component that can only be described as spiritual. Branding in its truest and most advanced incarnations is about corporate transcendence. And there's empirical research that backs Klein's claim in a series of studies published as brands, the opiate of the non-religious masses, we'll nod to Karl Marx there, in the journal Marketing Science, researchers from the US and Israel found that those subjects with strong traditional religious ties were much less likely to choose name brands for products that are used as a form of self-expression. And so the authors conclude that brand loyalty functions as a substitute for traditional religion. So commodity fetishism is not simply an obsession with things. It's not really materialism at all. It's a kind of dematerialization. And when use takes a backseat to exchange, commodities are inhabited by spirits and they become vehicles for a flight into the realm of transcendence. So maybe we're not so disenchanted after all. Both Weber and Marx think that regardless of what people say they believe, modern people's behavior shows them to still be in the thrall of their own creations. Enchantment still haunts the material world. For Weber, production becomes a living machine that traps us. And for Marx, products take on a life of their own that drain life away from us, even though we assume the world is rationalized and disenchanted. And all of these themes, and we want to suggest in this final section, are already found in the Bible, in the critique of idolatry. We, we tend to shy away from critiques of idolatry for some good reasons. It tends to be kind of sound judgmental and intolerant. And yet the concept of idolatry seems to capture something important about the contemporary scene that can't be left behind. So even though Pope Francis is renowned for his optimism and his love for all, he makes frequent recourse to the language of idolatry. In his first encyclical, Lumen Fidei, for example, he states that the opposite of faith 
is not a lack of belief, but idolatry. When one stops believing in God, one does not simply stop believing. Rather, one believes in all sorts of things. An aimless passing from one Lord to another, those who choose not to put their trust in God must hear the din of countless idols crying out, put your trust in me. Francis has repeatedly used the language of idolatry when describing the contemporary economic system. For example, we have created new idols. The worship of the ancient golden calf has returned in a new and ruthless guise in the idolatry of money and the dictatorship of an impersonal economy lacking a truly human purpose. Uh, you all recognize the golden calf there, right? Yeah. It's probably not too far from, from where we are. Idolatry, as Francis is using it here, doesn't refer to the explicit worship of gods with proper names. And the Bible often does use the term in this way to refer to you know, sacrificing to the god Baal, for example. But the Bible treats idolatry principally as a matter of behavior and not belief, as in Weber and Marx. Idolatry is not primarily considered a metaphysical error, but a betrayal of loyalty to the God of Israel. And for this reason, the primary biblical imagery for, for idolatry are adultery and political disloyalty. The image of adultery is exemplified by the story of Hosea, who's told to marry a prostitute to symbolize the dalliances of Israel with other gods. The political image is exemplified by 1 Samuel 8 when the Israelites ask for a king to reign over them. God says to Samuel, it is not you they have rejected, but me, not wishing me to reign over them anymore. They are now doing to you exactly what they have done to me since the day I brought them out of Egypt until now, deserting me and serving other gods. Talking about having a king, idolatry is more than a metaphor here. Although the king is not explicitly worshipped as a god, putting trust in a king instead of in God to protect them is idolatry. Note, though, that God does accept the existence of kings for Israel as long as they don't replace God. And so idolatry in this case, as in most cases, is on a spectrum of more or less. We're all idolaters, right? It's not always clear when the line has been crossed. So idolatry in a general sense is when people give an inordinate amount of trust or loyalty to something created rather than God. Isaiah, for example, accuses the Israelites of idolatry for putting trust in an alliance with the Egyptian army. Woe to those going down to Egypt for help to put their trust in horses who rely on the quantity of chariots and on the great strength of cavalrymen who do not look to the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah links this turning away from God with the idolatrous reliance on what is created instead of the creator. The, quote, the Egyptian is human, not divine. His horses are flesh, not spirit. And so in the biblical view, anything created can be an object of idolatry. So Paul criticizes those whose gods are their bellies and their minds are set on earthly things. And he warns against greed, which is the same thing as worshiping a false god. So the way Pope Francis speaks of the idolatry of money is, a, is deeply biblical, and it illustrates the fact that for the Bible, idolatry is not merely a religious matter, but an economic and political matter as well. The Bible doesn't really make such distinctions. Idolatry critique is not what we would call religious intolerance. So if you think about Isaiah's con or Elijah's contest with the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18, it's not just about religion. The rival gods represent two rival systems of rule and property. The name Baal means owner. The Baalist kings had absolute power and property was an alienable commodity under Canaanite law. For the Israelites, by contrast, the king was subject to the monarchy of God and property was inalienable. So each family had their share of property and idolatry was religious and political and economic at the same time. As Timothy Gorange comments on this passage, quote, every generation will be confronted with its own balls, their own strange gods who grab power over them and seek to devour them, end quote. So Weber's and Marx's idea that we become dominated by our own creations is embedded in the biblical critique of idolatry. In 1 Samuel 8, when people ask for a king to replace God, Samuel warns them that the king will take 
their sons for his armies and their daughters as servants, will confiscate their land and harvest and animals for his own benefit, and finally, quote, you shall be his slaves, and in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day, end quote. Jesus then is drawing on a long tradition of idolatry as domination when he warns, quote, you cannot serve both God and mammon. The Greek scripture leaves the term mammon untranslated here to personify money as a god, one that demands service. So the idea in Weber and Marx that inanimate objects come alive by taking life from us is also found first in the Bible. In Isaiah 6, those who craft idols out of wood and stone become as deaf and dumb and mute as their creations, although they imagine that their creations take on life. In Isaiah 44, a man uses half a block of wood to cook his dinner and the other half to make an idol, to which he bows down and pleads, save me, for you are my God. And though he imagines that the idol lives, in fact, it's draining life from him. The narrator comments, quote, all who make idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Likewise, Psalm 115 says, their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. So again, the attribution of life to inanimate objects steals life from the humans who make them or trust in them. So the biblical concern with idolatry implies that humans are spontaneously worshiping creatures. Now I'm going to get um, finally at the end here to something a little bit more sympathetic um, than idolatry critique. Um, there's this sense in the Bible, in the, in the critique of idolatry, Jusani's religious sense is here. So in Exodus, for example, the Israelites could stand a little bit less than six weeks of Moses' absence when he goes up the mountains before they demanded new gods to worship. People are spontaneously worshiping creatures. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, come make gods for us who shall go before us. The story of the golden calf is a story not just of the human capacity for self-deception, but of the inherent human need to worship. This recognition, I think, allows for a sympathetic account of idolatry. So Acts 17, Paul is in Athens. It says he was distressed to see that the city was full of idols, but he also sees the Athenians' idolatry as evidence that they're searching for meaning and ultimately for the true God. So he calls them extremely religious he says, God created everything and is therefore in all things, allowing that people would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he's not far from each one of us. For, as Paul tells the pagans, in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. So there's a sacramental view of the world here. God can be found in the beautiful things of God's own creation. Weber explains the basic human need to worship in terms of the need for meaning, which leads us inevitably to make gods. Weber is pessimistic that this need can be overcome, and so we're stuck in the iron cage. The Amazon warehouse is our fate. Marx, on the other hand, is convinced that people will cease making gods once the revolution comes. Workers control the means of production. Labor ceases to be alienated from its own products. But unfortunately, the revolution came and it made a new god of the communist state to whom tens of millions of lives were sacrificed. Unlike Weber and Marx, the Bible thinks there's a real god, different from all our manufactured gods. Rather than us creating gods, there's a god that created us and loves us and wants us to build a kingdom here on earth. In his famous Kenyan College commencement address in 2005, novelist David Foster Wallace told the graduates, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. 
There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. He goes on to say that the reason you might want to worship a real God, quote, is that pretty much anything else will you worship will eat you alive. Worship money and you'll never have enough. Worship your body and you'll always feel ugly. Worship power and you'll always be afraid and so on. As Weber and Marx and the Bible intuit, however, avoiding idolatry is not as simple as making a personal choice to change one's attitude. Idolatry is embedded in a whole economic and social and political system that holds us in its thrall. In an unjust system, we are all idolaters and there needs to be systemic change to free people from false worship. And if there is no true God, that task seems impossible. But as Jesus tells the disciples, quote, for mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. Thanks for your patience. So now we will have a few questions uh, from uh, Mr. Stephen Adubato, who is uh, a religion teacher at uh, St. Benedict's Preparatory School and one of the Crossroads coordinators. So, Stephen. Thank you again, Dr. Kavanaugh. Uh, so in your lecture, you focus mostly on the idolatry of consumption, material wealth, and technology. But I think it's also worth mentioning that a lot of the biggest idols of the 20th century were political in nature. So where would you say these political idols fit into your narrative of the idolatry of consumer capitalism? Yeah, um, good question. I, I'm, I'm gonna confess that um, you can only do so much um, in a, a lecture, so I decided to concentrate on the, the economic uh, issue. Um, but I certainly, in, in the book of which this is part, there's going to be um, uh, stuff on uh, the political ramifications of this as well. And it certainly is the case that, uh, you know, um, uh, I mean, Marxism, fascism, these are easy, uh, easy to see. Uh, nationalism has been called a religion. Um, the Carlton Hayes has a book called Nationalism, a Religion. And um, nationalism is on, on the upswing uh, again. And it's a complex phenomenon because there's, um, there's real uh, virtues that are being tapped into there. Um, there is the love of something, uh, the devotion to something larger than oneself. There is self-sacrifice. Um, there's love of your neighbors and, and other people that you consider to be part uh, of your group. Um, but political idolatry is particularly dangerous, I think, in some ways, precisely because it's parasitic on um, these kinds of real uh, virtues. And it ends up, I mean, there's a lot that's been written on nationalism as a kind of replacement for the church. And so as the 19th century rolls on, there's a kind of what I call a migration of the holy from the church to the, the state, and it becomes um, a kind of replacement for God. When, when you don't, when there's no God to kind of unite us all, then we worship ourselves, we worship us. I mean, nationalism is kind of a celebration of us, and it, it's a, a, a sort of deification of us, and that uh, seems to me to be a, a particularly dangerous thing. Um, and it's not always easy to, um, to separate. Um, Jean-Luc Marion, great Catholic philosopher, talks about a kind of splendid idolatry. And in some ways, the splendid idolatry um, is more noble and precisely because of that fact, a little bit more dangerous than the kind of unsplendid idolatry that I've been talking about um, now. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about splendid and unsplendid types of idolatry. So they if I can find a better word, if anybody has a suggestion for a better word than unsplendid, I'd, I'd love to hear it, but um, yeah, so, uh, but in this lecture I wanted to talk about um, uh, uh, the economic, the, the idolatry um, that's embedded in the way we treat the material world 
uh, in some ways because it's more um, it's more subtle and it's more uh, quotidian. It, it, it's it's just part of our daily kind of interaction with the material world, and so it's much easier for it to kind of go um, uh, unnoticed. So I wanted to focus in on one of the quotes from Weber that you cited. Uh, he says, we live as did the ancients when their world was not yet disenchanted of its gods and demons. Only we live in a different sense. As Hellenic man at times sacrificed to Aphrodite and at other times to Apollo, and above all, as everybody sacrificed to the gods of his city, so do we still nowadays. Only the bearing of man has been disenchanted and denuded of its mystical but inwardly genuine plasticity. So while modernity has largely done away with explicitly religious images and language, we still retain this religious sense, as Jusani would say, or this intrinsic desire for meaning, for something greater. In other words, we're always going to worship something. So can you comment a little bit more on the errat ineradicable nature of this human desire for meaning and what you think its trajectory is in the secularized world that we're in? Yeah, um, how do I know that that's... How does Jasani know that we have a religious sense? I mean, in in one ways, it's um, it's biblical, right? You know, um, I really, d you know, it, uh, I, I I cited a few things um, in the talk, but there's also, you know, is it Second Kings 17 where they talked about how the the Israelites went around putting putting altars on uh, under every green tree? It says, um, and I kind of feel like that's us. We, we have this spontaneous need for worship and to put um, objects of work or worship under every green tree. Um, but, um, but that, in a, in a way, is kind of part of um, just who we are as uh, people that relate to the material world in a sacramental sort of way. And so the, the line between sacramentalism and idolatry is there's a chasm that's a mile deep and an inch wide, you know, it's very easy to step over, um, um, even though it's a, 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 a tremendous chasm. But Paul is trying to work on that in Acts uh, 17, where he says, you know, you, God is in, God is creator, and so God is in all of the beautiful things of this world, and so that we can grope and, and find uh, God there. But it all depends on, on kind of how you do it. Um, there's a wonderful story in Dorothy Day's uh, autobiography, The Long Loneliness, where she and Forster, her atheist um, at the time, live in um, uh, common law husband. This is before she converted to Catholicism. But they're on the beach in Staten Island and looking out at the beauty of, um, of nature. And Forster always wanted Dorothy to remain in nature, that appreciate nature for itself. And Dorothy always thought you couldn't appreciate it for itself if you didn't look at it and see the kind of throbbing transcendence, the beauty of God, um, the creator that, um, that comes through uh, all of these things. And the difference between Forster and Dorothy there is I think the difference between kind of idolatry and um, and and um, whatever the opposite of a you know faith um, is but they both have this they come out of this kind of religious sense I think this sort of search for um, for meaning and um, you know I, I just think that Bruce Springsteen's right you know right everybody's got a hungry heart you know um, or pick the Eurythmics and say everybody's looking for something. Or Bob Dylan, you got to serve somebody, right? It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, you got to serve somebody. Um, John Lennon actually wrote a response to that called "Serve Yourself," and um, and that in some ways is the is the dichotomy. You got to serve. You got to serve somebody. You got to serve God, or you or you end up serving yourself. And I think Lennon thought of that as a positive thing, and I'm, I'm not sure about that. Because, I mean, ultimately, I mean, it just, for me, it just seems obvious that everybody's looking for something, that everybody's looking for transcendence. The only real question is, is, is there anything out there? You know, is the world a uh, comedy or a tragedy, right? Um, I think Sartre 
basically thought, yeah, everybody's searching for something, but the joke is there's nothing there, right? Um, and I, 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 and that so ultimately it's a tragedy. It's a it's a tragic kind of joke, but I f tend to think of the world. I tend to think Monsignor Albacete, too, kind of saw the world as a comedy uh, in the sense, not the ha ha funny sense, although it certainly is that, but also in the sense that um, the resolution is something good and 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 beautiful, right? That that we have this sense precisely because we have the, there's a God shaped hole in our hearts precisely because there's a God there who, who made us. So yeah, continuing on the point of the religious sense, I mean, Monsignor Albacete himself wrote and spoke extensively about the relationship between reason and the religious sense. And in his very popular book, God at the Ritz, which you said you teach in your classes, um, Albacete says, reason is the knowledge of reality according to the totality of factors. So here quoting Father Giussani, the reasonable person is precisely the one who is open to all the aspects of the experience of reality. Reason or rationality understood in this way is a demand of the heart of primordial or fundamental need for the experience of totality, of ultimate meaning, of sense. This makes reason into a manifestation of the religious sense itself, which is precisely the experience of the totality of life. So here we see Albacete challenging this idea that the religious sense, this desire for meaning, is something merely sentimental or irrational, or as Weber would say, separating you know, meaning and value from hard facts. So what can you say about the relationship between reason and the religious sense or the desire for transcendence? Yeah, I mean, you're a teacher, mm -hmm. Stephen, right? Um, I don't know about your students, but my students don't um, draw boundaries around these questions in the way that we try to train them to. You know, um, we d d students get frustrated when the biology professor, when they wanna raise theological questions in biology class when they're studying evolution, and the biology professor says, mm, you know, I, I don't do that. You go, go talk to the theology department. Uh, the students get frustrated with that for, for good reason, I think. And, um, and you can kind of see it in the way that even among scientists, there's this kind of spillover effect. They, you know, Weber says, oh, science doesn't answer meaning questions. Um, but there's scientists out there that are trying to answer meaning. You know, uh, Richard Dawkins, famous atheist, he's not content to be a biologist. He wants to be a philosopher, too. Um, because there's this sense that you need a whole, uh, that's what Monsignor Albacete is, is looking at, this kind of wholeness um, that, that, that you don't, s nobody really wants to specialize. Everybody wants a kind of broader um, uh, way of, you know, E.O. Wilson, another kind of atheist biologist, uh, wants to colonize the humanities for science and say that science is the only thing there is because he can't kind of be content with, uh, with, with what's there. So um, it seems to me like there's this natural sort of drive for holistic kinds of explanations. And we need, in order for reason to work, I think this is what the Pope is saying in Fides et Ratio, right? Um, that in order for reason to work, you need this kind of larger framework. Um, so to give one example, um, uh, Steven Pinker and Douglas Lakoff both have published books in which they try to extract politics out of evolutionary biology. And so they say evolutionary biology makes human beings this way, and so we just need to be scientific about this and get our politics from science. The only problem is that they come to opposite conclusions, right? One is a Democrat and the other is a Republican and they both say, well, clearly, obviously, this is what science uh, comes to, you know? So there's this, there's this, it, it just, it doesn't work without a kind of larger uh, framework um, where you break down these, these kind of, you know, um, fact value dichotomies. So going back to the Pope, um, I overheard recently that in an airplane interview, Francis declared that shopping on Amazon is now a mortal sin. Uh, can you verify this claim? <laughs> <laughs> You're making crap up, aren't you, Steve? Yeah, no, that's not true. <laughs> but he could say that, you never know. Uh, no, but in reality, <laughs> on this topic of Amazon, 
I can say for myself that I've come to rely on it more and more, especially Amazon Prime, because this idea of being able to access a product within a matter of days at a discounted uh, price, it's very convenient, especially being a teacher running around every day. Um, and you know, seeing your lecture, hearing what you had to say, it makes me stop and think, you know, at what cost? I'm able to access all these products very easily, but behind the scenes, I don't really like hearing what's going on in these warehouses. But then the alternative to go to a locally owned bookstore, to actually go out of my way, go in my car and drive there, pay full price for the book or whatever it is, it's becoming less appealing. So realistically, how can, we fa how can we face the fact that we are living in Amazon's world and that it's becoming more and more difficult to stop relying on these idols of consumption and efficiency? Yeah, I mean, part of, part of what I'm trying to push back against is this idea of face the fact, right? That we live in Amazon's world. We don't live in Amazon's world. We live in God's world. And the idea that this is just our fate is something which I think is really a poisonous um, thing, right? The idea that there's nothing. There, it, it, have you seen the movie The Mission, um, right? Robert De Niro and Jeremy Irons, right? Um, and after they destroy the, um, the Jesuit missions um, uh, for reasons of state, um, the Portuguese um, representative says, um, well, we have to act in the world, and the world is thus, right? And the other character says, um, uh, thus have we made, he says, no, um, thus have we made it. And then, he, and then he looks in the camera and says, thus have I made it. He was the one who authorized the, the decision, right? And that, I think, is crucial, right? We have to act in the world, and the world is thus, is the easiest way to, I mean, the Genesis, if, if, any, if there's any message of Genesis, the first opening chapters of Genesis, it's pushing back against the idea of fate, right? It's saying that the way, the whole idea of the fall is not pessimistic, it's optimistic, right? Because the fall means that there's something good to fall away from. So the original creation is good, and then it gets messed up. And that means that the way things are is not the way things are meant to be. And the way things really are, and, the, and is not the way things really are in God's eyes. And so the, the idea that it's just the way it is, I think we, we really need to, to push uh, against that. And there are certain things that we can do. Um, as w I mean, the, the, one of the first things that needs to be done so the first thing I think that needs to be done is pushing back against this idea that we're just fated and there's nothing we can do because this is something that we made. I mean, that's the point of the, the whole lecture is that this is not something which is given. This is something that we made. These are our, our creations and we can unmake it. We make it through our own demand for cheap stuff. Um, so the first thing to push, push back against this idea of fate. Second thing is... Um, uh, has, has escaped me entirely, um, but um, it will. Uh, um, what, what was? <laughs> what was um, seeing people, right? Um, the, 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 uh, precisely this whole. I mean, the whole problem with our economic system is that it makes people invisible, and internet shopping has made this dynamic, has ramped it up to an nth degree. Now you need to have no contact with another human being at all. You don't need to, to see a picture of another human being. You click, you, all you see is the product, you click on it, and then it appears on your doorstep. And so we need to start seeing the people that are behind it, the people that are, that are you know, um, uh, paying with their own lives um, to, to, to make this convenient uh, for us. And then we need to resist and find ways to, I mean, and there are lots of different ways. You know, I, I, I never order anything off of Amazon. I look it up on Amazon and then order it from my local bookstore. And it means an extra trip down there. But there's this, there's this wonderful essay by Wer Wendell Berry called The Joy of Sales Resistance. And I think this is the final thing that I want to say is um, there's a certain sort, this, it, it has to become part of, of our spirituality, right? That you have to find joy in this encounter with other people. 
and and joy in the resistance to the man, right? Sticking it to the man and all that. That's, that's you know Wendell Wendell Berry's the the joy of sales resistance and the the kind of encounter with the material world in a different way that is ultimately uh, sacramental and and trying to make that and the goal is not purity i'm not pure by any means either i mean we're all enmeshed in this kind of system and we're all idolaters right um but there's uh the but the goal so the goal is not purity but the goal is this kind of receptivity to what god is doing uh in in our world and i think god is doing beautiful things in all of the though you know small kinds of e economic experiments that are going on out there and people are finding ways to reconnect with one another through material things and through the relationship with the process of production and consumption and and that's a that's a beautiful that, that's a beautiful thing it's god's world it's not amazon's world yeah i would want to go a little bit further into this point about what god is doing in amazon's world because I think what's most interesting about your presentation is that you draw this common thread throughout these very distinct sources. You have Weber, Marx, and the Bible, all converging on this idea that we're imprisoned, we're enslaved when we idolize these material goods which are not actually transcendent. But the Bible is different in the sense that you know there is this way out. So even though man cannot liberate himself, even though you know we're kind of powerless in front of the idol, we still have the freedom to be receptive to God's will, to his initiative in our lives. So with that being said, tell us a little bit more about where you see God acting in Amazon's world. What exactly can he do for us as we're trying to make our way through this iron cage? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, um, there's that uh, section in uh, the, the second chapter of the book of Acts where um, it talks about how um, the early church community uh, met uh, and broke bread and rejoiced together and held all of their goods uh, in common and every day people were added to their numbers because they could see the joy uh, of this. And um, that's really kind of the only way you can um, witness to the idea that the Messiah has come, right? So. Um, you could excuse the Jews and the pagans at the time for saying, what do you mean the Messiah has come? What Messiah, right? The world still looks the same to me. People are still killing each other. You know, what difference? What, what Messiah? And the only response that the early church could give was in their lives. You know, they saying, no, the world has changed. And, and here, look at, look at this community living differently uh, in this joyful way that's receptive to God's grace. And I think that's, you know, in some ways that's, and, and again, it, it can be small. One of the wonderful things about concentrating on these acts of consumption and so on is that they can be very small things. They don't have to be terribly heroic things, but just small, beautiful things that connect um, the material world with people and, and make it uh, a, a more um, kind of just world. W when I lived in Minnesota, the... Um, there was a consortium of churches that had a relationship with a cooperative of organic farmers, and they marketed directly through the um, through the churches, and that was one way of kind of creating this alternative economic space that was not ruled by supply and demand, and that was not ruled by a ruthless kind of profit um, motive, but was ruled by grace. And in, in, in a way, that's, that's the only way we can kind of witness to what God is doing among us, it seems. So please join me in thanking Dr. Cavanaugh one more time. Thank you. Before we finish, I'd like to close with a quote by one of Monsignor Abbasetti's favorite authors, Franz Kafka, uh, who I think really captures this ideal of someone who's aware of his need for transcendence, for a meaning beyond himself, um, that comes from beyond. So Kafka says, I try to be a true attendant upon grace. Perhaps it will come, perhaps it will not. Perhaps this quiet yet unquiet waiting is the harbinger of grace, or perhaps it is grace itself. I do not know. 
but that does not disturb me. In the meantime, I have made friends with my ignorance. Thank you.